I think what uh, Rod was trying to say is that I'm a fighter of lost causes. Yeah, but hopefully not, not forever. I'm really delighted to be here because I think what you're doing is really, really important. Uh, I think it's really important to create a new home for people that kind of bring together the kind of ideas that we've been listening to. I think it's really important to take public life seriously in the way which you guys are trying to go about because I think that at the end of the day, you know, we cannot rely on people in the establishment to solve the problem for us. At a certain point, we have to take matters into our own hands. And even though we begin with uh, little resources, there is no reason that once we begin to get going and, and get animated, we cannot sort of uh, act as a magnet for other people, for millions of other people who at some point, some level, think the way that we do. The thing that I want to talk about is something that's in your uh, very important document, The End of Indifference, which is to explore indifference. Why indifference is such a big problem. See, the way that I look at it, <clears throat> with indifference, is that indifference manifests itself in all kinds of ways. And the most pernicious form of indifference in our world is that of moral neutrality. When we basically suggest and we basically argue that you know, Frank, there is no such thing as right and wrong. You know, Frank, there is no such thing necessarily as good and evil. You know, when children are told in school that there is no such thing as truth, when they're told there is no such thing as truth, and sometimes they even call into question the idea that you can make a distinction between beauty, something that is truly beautiful, and something that is ugly. And when you look at the kind of dictionaries, the vocabulary that's been invented to anesthetize us morally, it is really quite formidable. So for example, at the university where I work, where I often make the mistake of using a moral language, I'm often accused of all kinds of cultural crimes. So when I talk about something as being beautiful, somebody looks at me, you know, Frank, that's a manifestation of lookism. <laughs> lookism. Right. You, you kind of wonder who invented this word. There is somebody in California, in Los Angeles, who, <laughs> who is busy inventing all these, what for lack of a better expression, called bullshit terms, <laughs> that then become institutionalized extremely swiftly. So to call somebody's behavior, uh, like myself, who makes judgment, who makes distinctions between good and bad, right and wrong, is now called judgy. I don't know if you ever came across the expression judgy. But the meaning of judgy, the reason why you get accused of being judgy, is because in British society, the foundational value of all institutions, including schools, has become non-judgmentalism. Non-judgmentalism, it's a good thing. Non-judgmentalism basically means we are indifferent. We are indifferent to each other. We are indifferent to all kinds of outcomes. And when you get to the point where your six, seven-year-old child comes home and says, Daddy, Daddy, you know, I learned to be non-judgmental you do begin to realize that their moral education has been put on ice for a very, very long time. You do know that society is deeply in trouble because if we don't make moral judgment, then what we are doing is that we become bereft of all the moral resources that we need to make our way in this world. You don't have to be religious, I'm an atheist. But for me, morality is just as important as to a Catholic or a Jewish person, because you recognize that without moral boundaries, who we are as human beings in public life and in private life becomes disoriented and becomes disrupted. So to me, the lack of judgment that we've institutionalized, and by the way, if you don't believe me, look at every mission statement of every corporation. Look at every mission statement of every school and every university. 
Again, it's all written by the same person in Los Angeles, California, <laughs> who just kind of, you know, sort of schlebs them out to everybody. But they all have, you know, their value statement all say the same thing. We are, you know, non-judgmental. And, you know, you always get the impression that as the person is writing this, he or she expects a standing ovation. Yes, we are non-judgmental, and that's really, really good. But in political terms, to be non-judgmental actually means that we don't take it seriously as citizens. Because it's only when I talk to you, I listen to you, and I judge to myself, is she right or is she wrong, that you become a fellow citizen that I take seriously. If I say, oh, I'm non-judgmental, but I'm really saying I couldn't care less what you're saying. It's of no moment to me. That's really what we're saying under those circumstances. And that's a very big problem. Because if we're not judging each other all the time, then how can we crystallize a, a political or an intellectual or moral outlook that gives us guidance to make our way in the world? How can you do that? And what do we have? If you listen to the language of our politician, when was the last time you had Boris Johnson or a Labour Party politician actually say, I support this policy because it's good. I support this policy because it is right. No, they don't say that. What they say, this policy is evidence-based. Right? Or what they say, this policy is based on research. Right? Or what they say, oh, you know, oh, I'm not sure exactly what the policy is, but we're following the science. So you can really see these little policy documents following the science. They go little, little feet, and they're kind of following the science, right? Or, or they kind of, uh, somehow there's this kind of body of evidence which kind of miraculously mutates into a political statement. The reason why this is a problem is because you cannot have a serious debate. You can't have a serious political argument if somebody says, oh, it's based on evidence, or oh, it's based on research, because the, the logic of that is that if you, are, if you go against science, you go against research, you go against evidence, you're somehow a marginal outcast. What they're saying, in effect, is the old Thatcherite statement, there is no alternative. I mean, that's what it is. Tina becomes you know, sort of evidence-based policy, research-based policy. It becomes following the science. And it seems to me that this is really, really quite important. And it's important even on the personal level. Because unless we can engage with each other morally, it's very difficult even to conduct a conversation without, without somehow feeling that you're being censored. One of the things that I do because I'm a sad person, I haven't got a social life, is that when you're out there in a pub on a Saturday night, I look at words on the computer, and I've been collecting all the different words and the vocabulary that, are, that people use to avoid making judgment. It's one of my obsessions. And one of the things that I've picked up on recently, I don't know if you picked up, is the word shaming. You know, I love that word shaming. The assumption is, is that you cannot shame somebody that somehow shame should be abolished from our vocabulary, that that shouldn't really be there. So I began to look, you know, you know, what kind of shaming is there that you can no longer do? Well, of course, there is body shaming. You can't say anything about your body or somebody else's body. There is slut shaming, which is that somehow you cannot uh, even imply that somebody is a teeny bit promiscuous or anything like that. There is skinny shaming, weight shaming, snack shaming, online shaming. I counted 48 different forms of shaming. It basically means that you cannot make a statement. You cannot judge somebody's behavior in any shape or form without being told that that is somehow wrong, that we've got to be morally neutral, that we cannot make a statement like that. And I think that ultimately what this really leads up to is that you cannot make a distinction between normal and abnormal. I mean, I don't know if any of you work in a university like I do, but whenever I use the word normal, and, and when I use the word abnormal, it's, I feel like Dracula does when you get that cross in front of you. 
you, you get the faculty all, you know, kind of carrying this thing, and, and they're kind of hoping you're going to disintegrate under the spell of their virtuous views of the world. So basically, if you talk about normality and abnormality, you become automatically a prejudiced individual. So I think this is really quite important because what you're really saying is there is no such thing as a normal relationship. There is no normal family. I mean, in sociology, if you use the word a normal family, that's committing a cultural crime. I mean, how can you talk about a normal family? We have families and we, we don't talk about any norms or any kind of aspirations in that direction. But you know, this loss of moral boundaries that we're talking about has a purpose to it. Because the more we become neutral in the way we talk about the world, the more we become indifferent to each other, the more we plunder the moral resources which we require in our lives. And have you noticed that the same people who swear on the Bible of non-judgmentalism suddenly mutate into its opposite? So, for example, just mention the fact that you're for Brexit. Well, people don't say, oh, that's really cool. You know, in my university, don't say, oh, you're for Brexit, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm for Europe. That's, that's interesting. Let's have a discussion on it. They don't say that. They don't say that. Instead, what they do is they put up the little cross again, you know, and, <laughs> and they hope. And they hope that you're going to uh, kind of disintegrate. Or just say, for example, that, uh, you know, as I did, I made a mistake the other day of saying that a nation has a greater duty to care towards its citizens than towards a stranger, and immediately you're racist. But they don't say, oh, that's a really cool idea. You know, I, you know yes, we should look after our citizens more than people that live thousands of miles. They don't say that. They call you a racist. They make a very clear judgment about who you are. And just for example, just for example, politely decline to tell people what your pronoun is, right? Just tell them, I haven't got a pronoun in the way you t they talk about it. I'm a man, you know, sort of, and that's all there. Just look at me. I don't need a pronoun, you know, sort of. And the minute you say that, don't say, oh, that's interesting. That's a linguistically uh, different take on the whole issue of pronouns. They don't say that. You know, what they say is that you're somehow uh, transgender phobic or some kind of phobic, which is one of their favorite kind of expression. So in a sense, what you find is that their indifference mutates into a demand that you reject the moral values that you grew up with, that your parents grew up with, that your ancestors grew up with, because that's really the whole purpose of this. Now, I just want to really touch on what I think is the most important point about for me about the discussion of indifference. And that's what it's doing to our children. Because you know when little Mary and little Johnny go to school, when they're six or seven, and they're told to be morally neutral, something very interesting happens. For example, I did a series of interviews with young mothers who were surprised to discover, listening in on the Zoom uh, discussions during lockdown, that their teacher were telling little Mary Oh, don't worry about being a she or a girl or a boy. That's not really important. Why don't you embark on a quest to discover what your real gender is, and then you can decide for yourself. So just imagine, right, you're not exactly intellectually independent yet. You haven't got a sophisticated view of gender politics. You're seven or eight years old, and you're told, ah, okay, your daddy might say you're a girl. Your daddy might say you're my little girl, but you got to go out and discover who you really are. And that happens in our school. So just imagine the moral disorientation, the serious moral disorientation that we're creating when we re refuse to take morality seriously in the language of our everyday life. I think education, to me, is the key issue of our time. It's the key battleground. And if the SDP is going to make real headway, it's going to have to have really good policies on education because the target audience the really important target audience are the parents. You know, millions of parents are worried about what their kids are learning in school. They are really desperately worrying about this. And the good news is, for once I am going to end on a good, good news story, is what happened in Virginia, yes. right? I mean, what happened in Virginia? <laughs> a 
And the reason why that's good news, I'm not a Republican, you know, I haven't got any interest in American politics, but what's really good about Virginia is that the parents decided to take their moral language seriously. And when fathers and mothers heard what their children were learning in school, they, didn't, they weren't indifferent, they didn't fold their hands, oh, that's interesting, the teachers know better than we do. You know, they didn't say that, instead they rebelled. And when they rebelled, they were denounced as domestic terrorists. Right? Seriously, they were called domestic terrorists for daring to yell and shout at school board administrators who were teaching them all those horrible things. And what happened there was that suddenly this revolt of parents, and it was the revolt of parents, actually led to a major electoral triumph for decency. I and mean, that's how I interpret it. It was a triumph for decency. And for us, you know, we have got to believe that decency will prevail. We have got to believe that if we learn to become morally judgmental, and we learn to begin to make distinctions between right and wrong, and if we take ourselves seriously as moral human beings that are capable of making distinctions between right and wrong, and not leave it up to the establishment to tell us what, is, what we should do, I think if we can do that, then we can communicate a kind of language, a kind of narrative, almost a buzz that will have a major appeal upon our society. Thank you.